muchas gracias. Normalmente me mandan. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I think uh, we can begin. Uh, my name is Laria Crotti. I'm a policy assistant at Eurodad. Thank you for joining uh, today's webinar, which is co-sponsored by uh, Eurodad, Erla Seyar, Jubili Caribbean, and Latin Dead. A uh, few things before we start. Uh, the webinar is going to be recorded for you to know. So uh, yes, it's recorded. And the second thing, uh, there is a Spanish interpretation available. If you would like to access it, uh, you just click on the small uh, glow that you see at the bottom of the page. Uh, in Espanol, por si quieren acceder a la interpretación simultánea, ven aquí abajo hay un globito y le pueden dar clic para uh, escuchar el webinar en español. And, uh, yeah, I see that some people are reading, raising their hands. So if you would like to interact uh, during the webinar, uh, we have uh, a Q&A box uh, also at the bottom of the screen. You can write uh, your questions there and uh, uh, there will be a 20 minutes more or less Q&A at the end of the presentation. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we are going to present uh, Erla Cesiar, uh, recent uh, paper, Adapt Moratorium for Whom? Uh, as you might know, last year in April, uh, the G20 finance ministers uh, adopted the debt service uh, suspension initiative, uh, which tries to help uh, poor countries uh, fight uh, the uh, impact of the pandemic. However, only 73 countries are eligible to access this initiative. And uh, today's paper from Erla Sillar uh, is analyzing uh, the logics behind this inclusion and exclusion of such countries, which uh, basically is based on the income rather than on the actual real debt problems. And today we're focusing on uh, two regions, especially, which are Central American and the Caribbean. Uh, we have today with us Jürgen Kaiser, political coordinator at Erla Sillar and co-author of the paper. And also many special thanks uh, to um, Heron Belfort, uh, who is uh, a coordinator at uh, Jubilee Caribbean based uh, in Granada, and to Georgina Munoz, uh, who is the executive director of Red Nicaraguense de Comercio Comunitario. Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, well, um, without further ado, Jürgen, if uh, you're ready to present the paper, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Ilaria, and uh, thanks for organizing this and giving us the opportunity to present a paper that we actually worked on at the end of uh, last year. Um, I trust that a few of you may have already seen it because it's available not only in German, but also in English and in Spanish, and you can find it on the web. Uh, I think uh, Ilaria or someone can put the links uh, into the chat if that's necessary. So there's not much need for you to uh, uh, to take notes uh, because uh, almost everything that I'm going to talk about is also in those um, in those papers. The point of it is uh, of the the whole paper is that uh, whenever you define a group of countries that are to benefit from debt relief in this case or any other benefit, um, you always have ins and outs. That's Necessary, not necessarily so. This is uh, not by half a set, but uh, it's uh, quite normal. So the question is about the quality of the selection, whether you target the right people, or in this case, uh, the right countries. Um, Ilaria has already introduced the DSSI to you, so I don't need to do this again. What's important for us is that the criterion for selecting countries that are to benefit from the DSSI are not novel. This is nothing that has come into creditors' minds in some time in 2020. But if you go back to debt relief efforts in the early times of the Paris Club uh, uh, of the, in the 1980s, for instance, then you will see that uh, confining debt relief to the uh, poorest countries is a kind of pattern that they have followed. So the research that we have been doing is to see what are the, Im what are the implications of this kind of policy on the part of the creditors. And uh, 
it um, does not necessarily mean that you benefit the wrong people, but there is not much of a guarantee that you benefit the right people. So we have selected two uh, exemplary regions in the world, mostly because in those two regions, countries are relatively homogeneous regarding the size of the countries, of the population, the economic structure, the economic problems, exposure to external shocks, namely Central America and the Caribbean. And what's come out of it, I would like to present to you, I hope I can now share my screen. If not, I have a problem. Can, can you see the presentation? Oh, that's yes, it works. Okay, so here we go. So here you have the countries that we have been looking at. There are two groups, namely uh, seven countries in Central, Central America and seven small island states in the Eastern Caribbean. And the colors indicate which of the countries, namely those who have been printed in bold, have been uh, uh, nominated potential beneficiaries of the DSSI. And the colors indicate whether they have accepted it or not. So in Central America, we have two countries that could have benefited but rejected it, namely Honduras and Nicaragua. And in the Eastern Caribbean, we had four countries that could benefit. Three have accepted Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines has rejected. It. So that's where we are. Now we go through the various threats that these countries undergo uh, in order to check whether the beneficiaries are those that are most threatened by destabilization, fiscal economic destabilization. And uh, the first of the criteria is the debt situation ahead of the pandemic. Uh, these are data that we have taken from the Global Sovereign Debt Monitor that LSCI is publishing uh, at the beginning of every year. In this case, we have tried to compile data for end 2020, which as you can imagine was not so easy. Uh, we, we use five debt indicators, which are the ones that you find on the uh, left-hand side. Three of them related to external debt and two of them to total public sector debt. And uh, we then assess whether countries threat, uh, um, cross critical thresholds or not. Um, the colors indicate whether countries are in a difficult situation. And without going into any details at this point here, um, please take a look at the, um, at the lowest uh, row, uh, which is a kind of summary which indicates whether the situation of the country is slightly critical, critical or very critical. And you see that the only very critical country is El Salvador, a non-beneficiary of the DSSI, while particularly Honduras, but also Nicaragua are relatively benign. The situation is not good with Nicaragua's external debt to GDP at more than 90%, but it's not as dramatic as the overall situation of El Salvador, where all the indicators are in a, in a critical range. The second criterion is the consequences of the COVID pandemic. To that end, we have uh, compared IMF growth forecasts. Uh, the last one that we had before, uh, or from the pre-COVID-19 era, with the latest one that we had before we uh, finalized the document, which was about October 2020. And what you see here is the resulting downgrade from, for example, in Honduras, you had 3.5% growth forecast, and that was corrected to a negative growth of minus 3.3%. Uh, what you can see is that they are more or less all in the same range, so not much of a difference between the ins and outs, with one outlier, namely Belize, which uh, uh, was first projected, was projected 2.5% growth before the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and then minus 12%. So again, Honduras and Nicaragua, the two potential beneficiaries are not the ones that are most affected. The third indicator is health vulnerability. This is where we have tried to look at uh, 
uh, in how far the pandemic itself, not its economic fallout, but the pandemic itself has affected the economies of the seven countries. And uh, if you disregard Nicaragua for a moment, uh, the very nice indicator of only 84 infections per 100,000 inhabitants has more to do with uh, the domestic situation in Nicaragua than with any reality of the people on the ground. But you see that Panama and Costa Rica are the two countries that are most affected, again, two that have been disregarded by uh, by the creditors when it comes to providing debt relief or a debt moratorium through the uh, DSSI. Finally, we have looked into uh, vulnerability to climate change. This was not the purpose of the DSSI, of course, so you may consider this a bit unfair, but I, I think that given the extreme exposure of both regions to the effects of climate change, it makes sense to uh, also look at uh, the, the moratorium could potentially be a, a response to what we have seen in this case in Honduras and Nicaragua with the latest uh, hurricanes. And uh, what we have here is ranks. So the lower the number you see for each country, the more critical the situation is. Panama is relatively benign with 130. That's the ranks in what is called the German Watch Global Climate Index 2020, which has been established, at least among NGOs, as something like a um, standard for assessing uh, climate vulnerabilities. It's a bit problematic at some point because they normally only consider data from, from the latest year where data are available. So it's not necessarily long-term trends. So the situation for both Honduras and Nicaragua may ch change quite a lot uh, when they use uh, the latest uh, 2020 data uh, with the two hurricanes. But uh, for the time being, uh, we see again that these two beneficiary countries are more in the midfield, while the most affected Belize has not uh, benefited from, from the debt moratorium. Um, Oh, stop, sorry, that was a bit too far. So where are we? In summary, what we can say is that in practically no aspect of um, vulnerability to external shocks, the two countries that have been offered, in parentheses, but rejected, um, the, the debt moratorium are those that are most affected. They simply are the poorest ones and have uh, been selected for the moratorium for no other reason than this. Uh, so the, if you want something like a targeted initiative, we can say that um, in Central America, it has clearly not been targeted very well. So let's take a look at the Caribbean. We also start again with the debt situation. Uh, to recall, we have four countries that have been offered the um, the moratorium, which is Dominica, Grenada, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent. And we see that the situation is not as disparate as in Central America, but all the countries are, or almost all the countries are pretty vulnerable when it comes to public sector debt. Um, not so much when it comes to external debt. We also have a specific situation because Grenada after a still unconcluded debt restructuring is still considered as in debt distress by the IMF. So the situation is rather um, uh, uh, uniform throughout this, re uh, this region with uh, outliers, of course, in Antigua and Barbados, two countries that have not been considered for the moratorium. Uh, again, next check, health vulnerability due to COVID-19. Uh, as I said, we finalized the document last October. And so we had the number of infections per 100,000 inhabitants and the death per 100,000 inhabitants. When you compare this to European or North American data, you may find these are quite unalarming data. Um, this is why I have put 
the more recent figures uh, that I found uh, for two weeks ago uh, behind it, but only for illustrative purposes, because last October was in fact the, the moment when creditors had to decide whether they offer someone a moratorium in order to fight the consequences of the pandemic. And also the moment when governments had to decide whether they wanted to take it when they were, uh, when they were offered it. Um, the situation again is not as clear cut as in, uh, in Central America, particularly if you also consider this, the developments that um, have followed later on. We see that Dominica, Grenada and St. Lucia do not stand out at all as countries most affected, but are rather the ones that are um, relatively, relatively unaffected. The last two elements that we look at is again the consequences of climate change, which you see here in the column on the extreme right. It's the same um, methodology that we saw with the German Watch Global Climate Index uh, in Central America. Again, it's the lowest data that show the most alarming pictures and in fact, Dominica, Grenada and Antigua and Barbuda are the countries that uh, are under the highest threat of uh, climate change effects or negative climate change effects uh, worldwide. Everybody else, St. Kitts and Lucia St. Vincent also is severely affected among more than 100 countries. The only outlier here is Barbados due to its uh, western, westernmost position where Normally, the hurricanes are not yet as strong as they are when they meet uh, the main, uh, the main uh, row of islands in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, the other element that we look at here is the, uh, the fallout from uh, the, the COVID-19 recessions. Again, it's the same methodology that we looked at in Central America, namely comparing the uh, latest IMF growth forecast from the pre-COVID era with uh, a forecast that we had um, about by October 20, uh, uh, 2020. Everything refers to the year 2020, in fact. And uh, um, you see here also in the second uh, column from the right, the resulting downgrade. And again, you see that they are, uh, that everybody is very severely affected, but indeed the least affected is one of the countries that has, has been offered debt relief, namely St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the outlier that has by far been most affected was uh, Antigua and Barbuda with a change from plus 5.3 to minus 10% in its growth forecast. Um, is of course outside the, uh, the um, offer for, for that moratorium at the moment. So where are we? Here in the Caribbean, the situation is not as clear as uh, in Central America, where we have two countries that have been offered uh, the moratorium, which you could even consider to be the least affected by, by the various uh, external shocks in comparison with the others, of course, that does not mean that uh, Nicaragua and, and, and Honduras will not be in difficult situations. I wouldn't want to say this by no means. But in comparison with the other countries in the region, we see that the proposal has targeted the wrong ones. The situation is not exactly as clear in the Caribbean but if we take a particular look at the debt situation and at the growth forecast, then we can see that, for instance, a, or there is a remarkable contrast between uh, a country like Dominica which, uh, and, and uh, Grenada, which have relatively modest downgrades uh, uh, different from, for instance, Antigua and Barbuda, which um, shows the most severe picture of them all. So to conclude, because my time's up, uh, what are the consequences? What can we learn from this exercise? I think it's 
basically two on a very general level. Let's, I hope we can go into more details after the commentaries from Georgina and Heron. Uh, one is very pra pragmatic and it says, do not exclude anybody from debt relief before debt sustainability has been assessed. Yeah, and, and I do not say this only on the basis of the research that we have been doing on those two regions, but that has been a lesson learned ever since the Paris Club had started to provide debt relief to some countries, but not to others. So the only meaningful basis for a decision whether someone needs or should be rewarded with debt relief, or let's say not the only, but the first, the foremost criterion should be a debt sustainability analysis and um, defining groups of ins and out before you even have done a DSA, a debt sustainability analysis is a recipe for failure. On a more general uh, basis, um, this does not come out of the blue. I mean that these mistakes have um, happened repeatedly has of course to do with the fact that the decision about a moratorium or a, an effective debt relief has not been made by any independent body nor by any um, uh, forum set up by both sides in a somewhat balanced way, but by creditors themselves. And allowing this to happen is already the first step uh, into an inefficient and unfair process. So this is definitely something that we need to think about and, and uh, bring about change. If we don't want to see these um, practices happening time and again, however, the COVID uh, pandemic continues. Okay, I stop here. Hope there's some food for thought and look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Jürgen, for the paper, for the presentation, and uh, for keeping track of the time. This was also very useful. And now we can move on to some comments from uh, the Caribbean region with Heron Belfort, who is uh, 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 the coordinator of Jubilee Caribbean. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I prepared a presentation, but I will prefer to just speak for example, just deliver the comments instead of sharing the presentation. Um, so before the pandemic, we, the Caribbean region had collectively the highest G debt to GDP ratio at 64%. And the classification of the Caribbean islands as middle high income nations directly prevents us from accessing funding opportunities um, on concessions with, and with lower interest rates. And most of our debts are from, as a result of our small economies or small countries where we do not have a lot of natural resources and so everything has to be imported. And so we have huge import bills. And in the event of natural disasters, the aftermath, that's where our bills, our debts, everything will increase. Um, so, the economic uh, fallout from the pandemic can be, sorry, can result in loss of income in the region. It is estimated that uh, there will be a 3.5 percentage point increase in the poverty rate uh, collectively. However, some islands will have uh, larger increases in this section, depending on whether they're into petroleum, such as Trinidad, or in our case, uh, tourism. Um, short-term impacts, uh, what we are currently experiencing are high unemployment, decreased wages, extreme poverty. Uh, we also have a negative impact on our healthcare system because as we know, um, if you're not well off and poor person, sorry, vulnerable persons are, it's estimated 33% more likely to not be able to um, have access to healthcare or to buy medication, therefore they're more likely to suffer from not only job loss, but also from the um, virus itself, the COVID virus. And so uh, that is like a double negative for us at the moment in the region. Um, speaking from being in Grenada, it's quite lax in activities, in business activities, in 
um, remittances from overseas. And so we are looking at our economy shrinking in front of us right now. And so going back to what Jürgen said in his presentation about, you know, Grenada being not so badly off prior, like when the research happened, that was prior to the pandemic. Uh, we are now in a situation where, and this is coming off a meeting with Minister Joseph a couple of months ago. We are currently in a situation where this hurricane season, 2021 hurricane season is estimated to be above average again. And we cannot at this point with our financial situation withstand a hurricane. We, we, it will have a great negative effect. It would really damage our debt to GDP ratio. We were doing well to get it down to six, low 60s, 50 something percent. However, we are heading back up to that red zone. Uh, so the medium long-term impact include a downturn in private investment and slow economic growth and recovery. And most of the islands, our main uh, source, of, source of income is tourism. And it is estimated now that tourism will not return to pre-pandemic levels until 2023, 2024, which means that in the meantime, we need to come up with ways to stimulate our economies locally. And so there's, a, there's currently a push to take part in uh, diversification of financial investments in addition to tourism or apart from tourism. So locally, we're looking at uh, reviving our agricultural industries. We saw a lot of people planting more, eating more local, um, exchanging foods and selling more locally, uh, pr locally grown pro uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, meat, meat was one of the biggest things, surprisingly, on our import um, build prior to the pandemic. And so uh, this, what we're trying to do now is to get to not only reduce our bills now, in the future, stimulate our local economy um, by, by investing in agriculture, renewable energy, and the promotion and consumption of local products and services. Uh, our growth for forecast is minus 3.5%. However, it is not enough. As Jürgen presented earlier, uh, we would have had a much higher growth, um, much higher growth expectations um, had COVID not happened. Okay, and so a degrees, decreased financial capacity now creates a challenging situation to properly, proper, properly, I'm sorry, to properly plan for or to withstand any natural disasters I mentioned earlier. Again, due to our size, we're very small. Uh, populations range from less than 100,000 to 260,000. We have the bigger islands, of course, Jamaica, Trinidad with the couple of millions, but most of the islands have 100 something thousand, 200 something thousand. And so um, this is one of the where, where the challenge lies. Uh, yes. So that's it for the Caribbean end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Heron. And thanks Thank for this overview. And now we can move on to the Central America region with Georgina Muñoz, who is the executive director at Red Nicaragüense de Comercio Comunitario. And Georgina, eh, cuando quiere con su presentación, por favor. Just a reminder that there is... Hola, ¿me escuchan? Yes, sí. Hola, buenos días o buenas tardes. Uh, o buenas noches a todos y todas. Eh, gracias por invitarnos a este seminario virtual que es de mucho interés para nuestra región eh, de América Latina y el Caribe y en especial para la subregión centroamericana por su alto contenido económico y de gestión de recursos en el contexto de la pandemia y COVID-19 y por la destrucción causada por los huracanes Iota y Eta, eh, así como las vulnerabilidades de nuestros países en vías de desarrollo, que realmente requerimos cambiar las reglas del juego y poner la vida al centro del desarrollo, como lo inspiran 
eh, los movimientos sociales, las organizaciones, las redes que trabajamos estos procesos y la misma Agenda 2030. Quisiera plantear, ¿verdad?, de que la moratoria de la deuda como título, ¿para quién?, realmente es un título que nos invita a reflexionar exactamente sobre las profundas desigualdades y empobrecimiento que viven nuestros estados, producto de la no apropiación de desarrollos endógenos y economías alternativas que fomentan y practican nuestros pueblos, porque hay una práctica real, pero que también esto entra en contradicción con tomadores de decisión a nivel nacional, regional y global, y se olvidan esas realidades que hoy nos está comentando Jürgen en sus planes y políticas públicas. Eh, eh, se escapa totalmente ese enfoque real que ellos quieren plantear sobre procesos de apropiación, armonización y previsibilidad, eh, queriendo aplicar todos estos procesos de forma generalizada. Desde nuestra región realmente nos sentimos identificados con el texto porque el documento deja claro, incluye, incluye esas realidades, no las voy a repetir, y eh, lo refleja directamente también más aún cuando plantea que el acceso a estos instrumentos se dan a través de la condición del PIB. Lo ven como única variable y eso no es realidad en las regiones de Latinoamérica y Centroamérica y el Caribe. Eh, está clarísimo, es, el servicio de deuda es bastante elevado. ¿verdad? Plantea que la iniciativa eh, de suspensión de, eh, de moratoria de deuda eh, claramente no toca la situación, el riesgo del cambio climático que vive en nuestras regiones y que agudiza eh, la falta de seguridad alimentaria y que amenaza la vida de nuestros pueblos. También eh, estamos identificados de que los sistemas de salud nuestros son altamente vulnerables. ¿Cómo vamos a pagar una deuda si tenemos una situación tan catastrófica? ¿Cómo vamos a plantear, eh, asumir moratorias de tan corto plazo si estamos pensando en que la reactivación económica lleva años? Nuestras deudas han crecido enormemente, aceleradamente, especialmente en Nicaragua después del abril 2018 de una situación política altamente conflictiva. Nosotros creemos también eh, eh, y lo han planteado nuestros economistas, los ha planteado el CEPAL, eh, toda el, la problemática que, que representa el desempleo a partir de toda la situación eh, de, de los migrantes que están quedando fuera, eh, la situación misma eh, de la pequeña y mediana empresa, la falta, digamos, de protección eh, a nuestras fuentes de agua, al medio ambiente. En nuestra región se está viviendo una hambruna realmente. Entonces, ¿de qué pagos estamos hablando? ¿Verdad? ¿A quién va ese pago? ¿A quién debe de dirigirse realmente si queremos aplicar estos tipos de, de, de mecanismos? Y por otro lado, el gran problema que tenemos de pandemia, que aún los datos que presentamos en la región son frágiles. Son débiles en alguna medida porque eh, toda esta parte del testeo no, no es tan confiable. Hay otras fuentes de observatorios ciudadanos que estamos planteando que nos afecta enormemente eh, la pandemia a mucho más eh, ciudadanos de lo que plantean nuestras cifras. Desde esa perspectiva, nosotros consideramos que el servicio de la deuda ya es bastante pesado para Centroamérica, en especial para los países que mencionábamos con énfasis, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, pero también trasciende a Guatemala, Costa Rica. El hecho de la iniciativa de suspensión del servicio de la deuda que plantea G20, eh, lo que sentimos que lo que hace es que la carga se vuelve más pesada en el futuro. Y eso no es una salida real, práctica. Eh, porque la recuperación 
eh, llevará un tiempo necesario en nuestra región y también deja claro que los ODS, los Objetivos de Desarrollo del Milenio, no va a ser posible eh, alcanzarlo. Hay una serie de aspectos que debemos de tener presente que también eh, consideramos desde la región y, y algunos de ellos también están en el documento. Es que a diferencia de la década de los 80, América Lati en América Latina, donde la deuda de los países estaba en manos de acreedores eh, privados, ahora la deuda está en manos de multilaterales. Eso implica nuestros métodos, nuestras incidencias, eh, nuestras estrategias. Tienen que ser diferentes y tenemos que encontrar salidas a, a esta problemática. Desde Centroamérica también eh, vemos que la suspensión del servicio de la deuda del G20 son excluyentes. Se prioriza Honduras, Nicaragua que pueden acogerse a esta iniciativa, aún los gobiernos no se han manifestado. Nosotros hemos estado investigando en ambos países el por qué. Ellos tienen sus razones, en algún momento seguro nos lo van a plantear. Eh, pero prácticamente son los dos únicos países que forman parte del grupo IDA, de países menos desarrollados de acuerdo con el concepto de Naciones Unidas, y que es una realidad, pero... Esa situación es igual en toda Mesoamérica, incluso México, eh, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, el mismo Panamá. Entonces, el nivel de riesgo prácticamente eh, de Nicaragua por deuda es bastante crítico. Aunque se plantean eh, situaciones bastante similares para los casos... Eh, de Honduras, ¿verdad? que es ligeramente crítico, pero el nivel de, endeuda, de endeudamiento en relación con el ingreso nacional bruto, en el caso de Nicaragua está superando más del 90% y en Honduras el 42%. En el último dato del 2019, eh, de acuerdo a los datos que da el Banco Mundial, prácticamente eh, nosotros estamos... Eh, en, en, en una situación como los países de la compañera que comentaba, si nosotros vemos Belice, Panamá, Costa Rica, El Salvador, mantienen niveles bastante parecidos, eh, eh, en una situación bastante crítica. Entonces el reporte que hace Jubileo Alemania coincide realmente con esta visión que nosotros planteamos eh, del tipo de exclusión que se está haciendo con los procesos que queremos eh, trabajar de cara a la moratoria de la deuda, pero realmente eh, no todo, eh, podemos decir, es negativo. Tenemos que buscar mecanismos, procesos que nos lleven al cambio. A lo anterior, eh, podríamos eh, añadir eh, las vulnerabilidades de nuestros países centroamericanos, que tampoco son tomadas en cuenta. Algunos de estos países en la región gastan eh, menos del 5% de su PIB en salud. Tienen una cama por mil habitantes. O sea, eh, es una cuestión bastante dolorosa, eh, catastrófica para nosotros. Y más del, del 50% de la población eh, vive en niveles de, po de pobreza. Se, había, se estaba estimando por parte de la CEPAL que más de 45, 45 millones de personas van a la pobreza o ya están en la pobreza y 29 millones hacia la extrema pobreza. Eh, para nosotros, sinceramente, desde las organizaciones, eh, creemos que eh, debe de haber una salida negociada y eso implica una moratoria de la deuda externa que incluya a todos los acreedores multilaterales, bilatera, bilaterales, privados, que permitan avanzar hacia un proceso de reestructuración de la deuda. Eh, y por eso estamos planteando una moratoria inicial, a, asumiendo esta propuesta del G20 de por lo menos los tres primeros años, que nos permita ir haciendo todo un proceso de negociación, de reflexión, para esa reestructuración anhelada, 
eh, si es posible crear un grupo consultivo similar al que fue creado para la iniciativa IPI luego del paso del huracán Mitch en 1998, que es una experiencia eh, muy positiva para, la, para el pueblo en sí, y contar con presencia de las organizaciones eh, que sean vigilantes de estos procesos y que los sectores más excluidos, como los pueblos originarios, mujeres, organizaciones sociales y comunitarias, en efecto puedan eh, eh, tener, satisfacer esas necesidades y avanzar en una verdadera reconstrucción. Que el destino prácticamente de esos recursos liberados sean directamente para programas, instancias de alivio de esa deuda, eh, el acceso a esos programas deben de estar dirigidos exclusivamente a considerar todas estas vulnerabilidades que hemos planteado las organizaciones de sociedad civil estamos dispuestas a colaborar en ese sentido y es urgente la participación de los movimientos, de las organizaciones sociales, de los organismos internacionales, es urgente las campañas, es urgente el ABC para nuestra población, para que conozca de qué estamos hablando y qué estamos comprometiendo de cara al futuro y poder sensibilizar eh, a esos tomadores de decisión. No podemos continuar priorizando el pago de la deuda y recortando los gastos sociales. Es como, es una gran contradicción, es como un disparate, así lo sentimos realmente. Yo creo que tenemos necesariamente eh, que buscar esos instrumentos, porque no existen hasta ahora, que nos permitan vincular el análisis de la sostenibilidad de deuda con la Agenda 2030, porque ahí hay una contradicción tremenda. ¿De dónde vamos a obtener esos recursos para que nuestros pueblos tengan una vida digna? No existe realmente una estrategia de financiamiento para el desarrollo. Por eso consideramos que esta iniciativa de G20, que plantea la suspensión del pago de deuda eh, por un año y que luego lo tiene que asumir y pagar los estados, no es la más pertinente, pero se puede trabajar y se puede incidir. Gracias, creo que me tomé un poquito más de tiempo. Está muy bien, muchas gracias, Georgina, por su presentación. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Georgina, for the presentation. That was very helpful and comprehensive. And now we can open the floor to some questions. And I can see that Geron uh, uh, already received a question from Nicola. And perhaps, Geron, you would like to uh, add some comments? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so go, I, one thing I forgot to add to my presentation, uh, when Jürgen said to not exclude anyone from debt relief, uh, I fully support that. However, I think it must come with some education, some stipulations to ensure that 10 years down the road, we're not in at this same point with the islands being back at 60% of the, you know, Um, borderline debt unsustainability, uh, because we regionally, we, we have been improving. I mean, pandemic aside, we were making little progress step by step, you know? And so one thing we experience is that whenever the government changes, the debt to GDP would either go up or to go down. And so um, in addition to what Regina said, we need, um, for, I'm not sure how this would work, but like an external body to check in or to say, well, you know, you're going a bit excessive now, time to rein it in and see how we can, you know, work around instead of borrowing, how we can stimulate local economies. And as I mentioned, we're trying to do it. It's taking some time, but, uh, I'm not sure what Jürgen would say on this. I think he put it clearer. And also, um, I fully agree that we need to have assessments carried out prior to making an offer for debt relief. And the, the countries who need it the most should get it. And so it should be um, somewhat of a triage situation, you know, where they give out the colors based on how bad your situation is, then you get dealt with first. 
Uh, so yes, so I just wanted to add that from the Caribbean region. And so it, it appears that we are not desperate at the moment and there are countries worse off than us. And I know Grenada accepted the moratorium until December 31st, 2020. And so, yeah, we probably could have given that opportunity to somebody else, but we took it. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Aaron, for your comment. And we have one more question for Georgina in this time from uh, Bergea Jon. I hope this is correct. And Georgina, la pregunta es, uh, ¿por qué no aceptó Nicaragua la moratoria y qué se tendría que cambiar para que lo acepten? ¿Cree usted que el gobierno aceptaría un proceso de tanta participación como después del, uh, del Mitch? Que creo que fue el otro huracán. No escuché, no se escucha. Puede levantar un poco más el tono. Eh, si ¿sí me escucha ahora. Ahora sí. Ok. Eh, hay una pregunta eh, que dice: ¿Por qué no aceptó Nicaragua la moratoria y que se tendría que cambiar para que lo acepten? Eh, ¿Cree usted que el gobierno aceptaría un proceso de tanta participación como después del Mitch? Sí, gracias por retomar el, este tema. Realmente hay una experiencia acumulada en Nicaragua a raíz de la iniciativa IPIC de países altamente endeudados. Eh, con Jürgen hemos estado platicando la posibilidad de tener las primeras reuniones con el Ministerio de Finanzas para poder ver qué tipo de proceso eh, podríamos eh, trabajar y generar más confianza y sinergia entre los organismos eh, internacionales y los propios gobiernos que están involucrados en, en este tema, los acreedores principales, eh, pero sobre todo el gobierno de Nicaragua ve con recelo porque eh, a Nicaragua le han impuesto una serie de medidas por la situación política que se vivió en abril del 2018 y el gobierno está como a la expectativa de qué es lo que va a pasar, eh, pero eh, a través del Ministerio de Finanzas y con un trabajo de incidencia que estamos eh, organizando no solo en Nicaragua, sino en toda Centroamérica para mover este tema de la moratoria de la deuda en función de los primeros tres años y luego poder avanzar en un proceso de reestructuración. Eh, tenemos planificadas las organizaciones, eh, todos los temas de formación, le estamos llamando el ABC en la deuda, nuevamente retomando las experiencias acumuladas y estamos focalizando planes de incidencia para los objetivos principales que nos interesan eh, porque también en Nicaragua hay que hablar con la Secretaría de la Presidencia, que es el que maneja directamente, eh, eh, incide mucho en que el presidente de la República pueda tomar eh, este tipo de decisión y es algo que estamos trabajando, veremos qué pasa. Eh, al inicio, entiendo, no se aceptó porque se siente como mucha presión internacional hacia el gobierno de Nicaragua por un problema de violación a derechos humanos que en la actualidad, debo decir, eh, se ha ido un poco estabilizando, aunque hay también cierres de espacios cívicos, pero eh, hay apertura también de trabajar con los gobiernos municipales, con los gobiernos regionales, y al final, esto a quien beneficia es a la población, es a esos sectores excluidos, es a los adultos mayores, es a las mujeres, es a los indígenas, es a los niños a los, y niñas. Es, es prácticamente eh, una necesidad y por eso el instrumento número uno que vamos a utilizar las organizaciones va a ser el diálogo eh, hacia esos tomadores de decisión, en especial hacia las instituciones y ministerios eh, de gobierno. 
Muchas gracias, Jorgina. This was very clear and thank you for answering. I think we still have time for one last question. Here in the chat, we have Henrik asking, is inclusion into the DSSI the right path to pursue for countries in all of these regions? And if so, how can they and we make it happen? And also there are alternatives to expansion of DSSI eligibility that would benefit those countries more effectively and uh, a one size fit all solutions or more tailored solutions. Um, maybe Jürgen, you would like to take this one. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Thanks uh, for the question, Henrik and uh, everybody. Um, I, th I think it's important to note that the, the DSSI is something like a, or has been something like a provisional instrument that was meant to help countries to come somehow alive through the, the, the year 2020. And after the special finance minister summit of the G20, 13th of November last year, it was clear that there was a big and growing number of countries that will need not just a moratorium, but something like real relief. And that's the most relevant point or the crossroad where we are at the moment. You may have seen that uh, uh, Chad, Zambia and, and a very few others like Suriname have already declared that they will not be able to pay. Some of them have requested real relief, not just a moratorium. Uh, and the key question now is, are they going to get it in a way that really is going to help them? Yeah, from our end, we are somewhere between uh, hope and despair <laughs> because we are still with the 73 country group. But on the other hand, uh, we see a growing readiness on the part of the G20. And just yesterday, we spoke to the leadership of the German finance ministry and they again praised the process, what they always do, of course, uh, for finally managing to include everybody in the G20, including, uh, of course, the new uh, US administration, but also the Chinese, who have been very difficult during uh, in the middle of 20, uh, the middle of 2020, into a consensus towards real debt relief, and. That's the crucial thing where we are at the moment. Yeah, what is going to happen to Chad, who have requested uh, relief? What's going to happen to the Republic of Congo? What's going to happen to Zambia, which is the most critical case at the moment? And if we manage to get a process where really all the creditors are on board, then I think there is a real chance that we get something as comprehensive as HIPIC has been in the, in the 1990s or even better than that. If they manage to block any such process, the creditors, in the interest of short-term um, savings that they could make on debt relief, then we are heading for another decade or even two decades of protracted um, global debt crisis. So this common framework is indeed the, the, the relevant point at the moment. Not many people will speak about the DSSI as a moratorium initiative uh, 12 months down the road because um, we, are, we are past that point. I mean, if, if you look at the indicators that we, that we have seen for the two regions, that's, that's the overall global picture. If you look at our sovereign debt monitor, you see those data and how much they are in red. So that's, that's the real process. Thank you very much, Jürgen. And uh, uh, I think uh, that more or less we are at the end of this webinar. Just a few things because before we close up. Uh, we would like to remind that uh, your dad is going to have another webinar uh, next week that is linked to this one to present uh, a new report, which is A Tale of Two Emergency, the interplay of certain death and climate crisis in the global south. I'm putting the link for the event here in the chat. As we also mentioned during this webinar, uh, there are different crises that we need to address. One of them also is the climate crisis, and we're going to discuss more about that uh, at that webinar. Then special thanks uh, uh, to Erla Sillar for the report, for joining us today, to Jürgen, 
and uh, to our speakers, uh, Georgina and Aaron, for joining us today and for you to attending. Special thanks, especially to the interpreters who allowed us uh, to have this meeting today and uh, yeah, for helping us communicating with different languages. So that's the good thing about Zoom today. Uh, I think uh, we can close here today. I see that maybe Todor has his hands up. We can squeeze in one question last minute, Todor, if you would like to, to talk. No, oh, sorry, it, I, it was accidental. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to hear your voice today. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks to the interpreter and the speakers. Yeah, yeah. And see you soon. Bye. Bye. Muchas gracias. Bye. Thank you for having me.